evening, church. That is the question that must be answered. That's what we're looking for in our study through the gospel of Luke. And so I want to welcome you to uh, grab a copy of God's Word. Uh, don't sell yourself short. Don't, don't, uh, don't leave here wondering. Uh, the proof is in the book. And so there's, uh, there's lots of Bibles all around you. If you have your own, awesome. You can open it up to Luke chapter 7. If you don't have one with you, uh, feel free to grab one. There's, there's Bibles in the seat backs in front of you in the pews and then also uh, here on the tables and you can grab one of those. And if you don't own a Bible, uh, feel free to take that one home with you and that's our Christmas gift to you. That's the best gift we could give you, God's Word, amen? amen. So uh, grab a hold of that and if you want to use a fake Bible and use it on your device, you can too. That's cool, no, no offense, love you. Um, I'm just old school, you know, and I need to have some pages, so uh, maybe one of these days I'll catch up. But we've been studying through uh, the Gospel of Luke, and I hope it's been beneficial to you. It's been very beneficial to me. Uh, I've read through Luke many, many times in my, in my Christian life, uh, but never uh, this slow, never this repetitive, and so I'm thankful for that because the Word of God does say that it's alive and powerful, and so every time you read it, what's, you should get something new, right? He hasn't let me down. It's been great. Everything that I've shared with you for the last couple of months in Luke has been all new stuff for me, and that's awesome. So I'm encouraged, and I, I believe that God will give us some new stuff here tonight. I've got some good stuff. I think it's good. I don't know if you guys are excited about it, but I'm excited about preaching, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So we've, we've been studying through Luke uh, because, uh, you know, God, God wants us to, to worship him in spirit and in truth, right? He, you know, I, I, I don't know if, if this, this is not the gospel, but, but I think that when, when you clapped a moment ago, like that was exciting to God. I think he likes it when his people are excited about him. You know what I'm saying? I really do. And I think there needs to be a little more festivity, a more festive spirit in the church. And so I, I love it when you guys clap. I love it when you, when you yell and shout and, and get excited. And please, just understand that uh, if you go to another church and you're now visiting this church or this is your new church, whatever, this is a church that, here, let me, hold, let me get a permission slip right here. I'm just going to fill it out right now. I'm going to fill out. You have permission to yell and scream and say amen and hallelujah. Like, that's right there, okay? It's cool to do that. Okay, it's cool to do that, and I think when you do it, you send a message to the Lord that you're excited about what he's done, you're excited about who he is, and since we're supposed to look to the future, I think you said, excited about what he's going to do in your life and in our lives corporately, and I'm excited about Jesus, and so uh, I'm pumped up. I was sharing with Jessica the other day that, uh, you know, the calendar is, is, is weird, like the calendar's going way too fast, right? I'm getting old, yo. Right, it's crazy, right? I, I remember just driving around with my buddy's Ford Bronco too. Sorry, but I was drinking beer and I was listening to Bon Jovi and now I have two grandkids. What's up? <laughs> like it was yesterday, right? It just happens, right? And, and now I'm, I'm getting old, but, but the calendar, like we're, we're getting ready to, to switch to a new year. Yes. 2016 is, is about gone, and 2017 is on the horizon, and I think, I don't know, I kind of lean over to the right side of the room, and I'm just thinking that with these two bellies up over here, 2017 is going to be an awesome year. You know what I mean? I think the best is yet to come in, in our lives personally and in our church. This is a brand new church, you know what I'm saying? Like, Susan, right, she, had, she, she hasn't been there in a while, and she walked in. It's like a whole fresh new church plant. This is it. It's a brand new church. It's a brand new church. Not just a brand new location, but a brand new church, okay? And, and, and let's just start it out right. We don't have to wait for 2017 to get excited. I like the way this is going right now. I like this. This is good. But we're supposed to worship him in spirit and in truth. I'm starting off new. I'm preaching from a barrel. Okay, so that's cool. So, so I love you, Jessica. So, so we're, supposed to, we're supposed to worship him in spirit and truth. And, and so when we lift him up, right, when we lift him up, what does he do? He draws people to himself. So when someone walks up in this joint and we're like lifting up the name of Jesus and we're praising him like crazy, he, the people walk in, they're like, oh, Jesus. They go, you ever see a moth to a light? Oh, Jesus. That's what'll happen, I'm telling you. It happens. It happened to all of you. <laughs> see, it happened to all of you. It'll happen uh, to the rest of us. So anyway, we're gonna, we're gonna keep studying Luke chapter seven tonight. That's gonna be our main dish. But before we go there, I kind of want to draw your attention. If you could, you could put your, your finger there and then also look in John chapter 20. Uh, there's, 
There's four Gospels, and it's a, it, I just want to start here in John real quick before we jump into, into Luke. There's four Gospels, of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they're four guys that wrote uh, the story of Jesus, basically telling us about who he is, and that's what we're looking for when I find out who he is so we could worship him with some spirit and truth. I don't want to worship some fake Jesus, do you? Like, that's a total waste of time. That would be stupid to be praying to this barrel. It's not going to get you anywhere, right? And so, so I want to pray to the real Jesus. And so these four dudes, inspired by Jesus' spirit, write this stuff to describe who this Jesus is, right? And so they're all different authors, but ultimately from the same source. And they're written to four different um, uh, audiences. So they're a little bit different, but pretty much they're all the story about Jesus, you know? And, and so John, here in chapter 20, towards the end of his book, he says something that's kind of strange, um, but I, I just kind of want to attack that thing real quick before we jump into Luke 7, because it'll really help frame the night, okay? So it says here in John chapter 20, verse 30, are you there? Okay. Do I, does God have your attention? No more phones? No more Facebook? No more texting? Okay, you're here. Look at your neighbor and say, you made a good choice. Awesome. Okay, so... So what does it say? Here, here's what it says. The disciples, that's you guys. The disciples, but here's the ones who hung around with Jesus, like in the flesh. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these, these ones that the author wrote, and it's apropos for all of them, right? Because there's a lot of things that Jesus did. He lived 30 years plus. A lot of things, right? But not everything made it in. But these ones are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So not just believe, but what? Continue to believe uh, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. So, so here, here, look also to that same neighbor say, God's word is sufficient, right? It's sufficient, so, so if you want to get to know who this Jesus Christ is, here's where you will find out, okay? Here's where you will find out. Everything you need to know about who he is is here in the scriptures, okay? And that's why we crack the Bible open here every single week. Not a lot of imagination from your pastor, just reading the scriptures. That's what we're supposed to do. So if you want to get to know him, this is where you go, okay? And so, like I said, though, Jesus lives 30 plus years. Is there anybody in here who's 30 to 33 years old? Raise your hand. You lying. You're a liar too, aren't you? You're a stinking liar. Is he? How old are you? 34. That's pretty close. That's pretty close. So, okay, so, so and I, I know that Dan and Katie can attest to this, that in the, in the short life of Justin Johnson, there's way more than what would be written in here. Oh, buddy. All right. All right, this would be one chapter. This is one chapter, right? Okay, I, I'm just wondering how many, how many dead people have you raised? Like none, right? How many times have you multiplied a Happy Meal and fed 5,000 people? Never, say never, right? Okay, Jesus did all that stuff and more, and, and, but only a little bit got in, right? Only a little bit got in. So there's a, there's a lot to Jesus Christ's life that never made it into the scriptures, right? And so why did some stuff get in and why did other stuff not get in? If this is enough to, to cause belief to swell up in you that you would give your eternity to this person, why is just this little bit in there? Like, I have to tell you this, and I think that's a pretty good conclusion, that if only a little fraction of Jesus Christ's life actually made it into the Bible— then doesn't that mean that whatever's in there has massive weight, yeah. right? Massive weight. If you melt it all down and only these things got in and only these things would cause belief to swell up in your heart for eternity, then each word has massive purpose, right? Massive purpose. And so we want to examine this section here in Luke chapter 7 so we could dig out what is being taught 
and more importantly though than that, the why that it's being taught. There's purpose in what Jesus is teaching here beyond the actual lesson that he teaches. Are you following me? There's massive weight here. So let's go to uh, Luke chapter 7. And, and let's read, this is the story that's labeled in your Bible as Jesus raises a widow's son, okay? So let's read this section together. It's, it starts in verse 11, it goes through verse 17. So it's just six short in length, but, but not short in power, uh, a message here, okay? Are you, are you guys ready? Yes. Okay, here, here we are. So, so soon after, just, just so you understand, before we read on, soon after, if you weren't here last week, he just healed a Roman soldier's sick, almost dead, beloved Jewish slave from afar. So, so his slave was sick and near death over by, um, I don't know, doesn't say, but like uh, Lake Sumter Community College. Y'all know where that is, right down the road here, right? But it's not like a, a, a stone's throw. It's, it's kind of a little bit of a walk, right? So, so just so you understand, his slave was over there, and Jesus is hanging out over here, and he just says the word, and that dude's healed. That's awesome, right? This is what happens. And so after that happens, it says this. Soon after, after that, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain. A large crowd followed him. That, that'll so preach right there. Like there's disciples and then there's people just poking their heads around wondering what's up. And I hope you're part of the first group. That's what we're looking for here. Okay, we're looking for real disciples. So just because everyone's hanging around Jesus, it doesn't make him a disciple of Jesus, right? Just because you go to church, it doesn't mean you're saved, right? Okay, so, so let's, jump, let's graduate. I want to graduate to the next group. I want that for all of you, okay? Let's be, let's be genuine disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, he says, uh, a funeral p- uh, procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. We'll talk about that in a second. As he approaches the village gate, coincidence, this, this, this funeral procession is coming out right then and there. The young man who had died, so is he sick? Or wh- what is he? Dead. What noise is he making? <laughs> You're right. I'm contextualizing the gospel. Okay, okay, so, so, yeah, church experts, they tell you what to do. Okay, so, so, the young man who had died as a widow's only son, uh, a large crowd from the village was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. That's awesome. Uh, Then he walked over to the coffin, touches it, and, and the pole bearers, right, they stop. And, and he says, he looks at the dead kid and says, young man, I tell you, get up. I don't know about you, but that just sounds like creator to me. He speaks at nothing, and then there's something, right? Okay, that's awesome. And he didn't, it wasn't a suggestion. He said, get up. Did the kid even have a choice? No choice, right? That, so then the dead boy sits up, surprise, and begins to talk. Must have been a teenager. And, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Great fear swept the crowd, and they praised God. I love that too. Listen, we need some fear of the Lord. It's not a bad thing. What's happening here? He does something awesome. They didn't go, hey, that was awesome, man. They were scared. Like that is... When you're around that kind of power, you could talk to, can you imagine if you went up to a dead guy? I mean, there's a funeral going on, right? Everyone's sobbing and weeping and sad, and here comes some dude and stops your funeral for your kid and looks at your, like, what if he said that and the kid didn't get up? Can you imagine how uncomfortable that would be? Unless you're God. Oh, I'm just saying, right? So he, he says this, and, and, he, and he says, get up. He says, get up. They were fearful, but out of fear, what happened? Did they run and hide? No, they praised God. They praised God. Fear of the Lord is a good thing. A mighty prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people today. And the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countryside. So, what's being taught and why? That's 
what we're here to examine. So we can get some truth, so we can have some spirit up in this joint, right? So, so in this text, let me just offer you this. This is just what, this is what I think just from reading it. I'm just saying that I believe right here in this text, and even in the story just before it, I think that Jesus is simply answering a very common question. That's very common today. It was very common when he was around in the flesh, but it was also a very old, old question way, 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 way back. And when I say way, way back, you might say, how far back? How far? Let me tell you how far back. I'm talking, we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't practice that either. That was just how we flow here. Just how we flow, right? So, so Exodus chapter 5 back. We're talking about way, way back. I'm talking 3,400 years ago this question was asked. I'm talking about 1,400 years before Jesus ever comes in the flesh that this question was asked. And you're going to see in just a few moments that that same question is still being asked today. And so when someone says, yeah, that old religious stuff, that was from back in the day. We're in a different time. No, sir, rebob. It's the same stinking question that's been asked for 3,400 years is still being asked today. And so I want to read that question to you, or with you, really. I'd rather have you read it. And so keep your finger there if you want to in Luke 7 and go to Exodus chapter 5. Now, if you went to church a bunch or like I did when I was a kid, I went to temple because I'm a Jewish guy. I didn't know anything about Jesus, but I went to temple. And, and if you went to temple or you went to church, I don't care if you're a stone-cold atheist up till this very day. You know who Moses is, right? And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about re the real Moses, you know, Charlton Heston. So, so you know Moses, right? Moses and the Pharaoh and, and Egypt and, 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 you know, let my people go and, and build bricks with no straw and the, all that Yule Brenner stuff. And so they're in slavery for hundreds of years. And, and it was really, really rough for them. And so there comes a day, and all of a sudden, God just grabs this dude, Moses, who's the prince of Egypt, grows up in the palace with all the riches and education and all the, the, the opulence, and he's a spoiled, rotten kid. And, 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 and all of a sudden, God changes his heart toward all that good stuff. And he's like, no, I'm going to go hang out with all the people that have nothing, and they're in bondage. That's my people over there. And, and so he goes to them. He's like, I want this now. My life's different. I don't want that stuff anymore. I want this now. And all of a sudden, God's like, hey, uh, Moses, you know those people that you say you love now? Yeah, I'm going to use you to set them free from Pharaoh. And he's like, oh, no way, dude. I don't think that was exactly what he said, but, you know, something along those lines. And, and so, so here's what happens. Moses is sent to go to the Pharaoh. And so after Moses is prepared, chapter 5 starts, it says, after this presentation, you know, Moses is spoken to by God. Moses goes to the leaders of Israel and says, hey, this is what's going to go down, man. And so that's the presentation he's talking about of Israel's elders, leaders. It says, after this presentation to Israel's leaders, Moses and Aaron went and spoke to Pharaoh. They told him, quote, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go. You all know that line, right? You've heard it. It's nothing new. Let my people go, right? So, and the details of why they were going to go do this and all that stuff, it's not the point. The point is, is there's this confrontation, and he looks at the Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And then, he's, and then the Pharaoh responds. <laughs> you just see it, right? Can you picture it? Is that so? Did you ever have someone tell you what to do? Oh, is that so? All snappy and arrogant, prideful. Arms are folded. Is that so, said Pharaoh. And who is the Lord? Why should I listen to him and let Israel go? So that's the question right there. So you see it right there. Oh, is that so? Well, who is the Lord that I should obey him, right? That's the age-old question. So God, with, with Moses as his mouthpiece, he goes to, to the Pharaoh, who's the most powerful king of the most powerful army, of the most powerful nation, of the most powerful empire on the world. 
And, and God says, I want you, the most powerful person, of the most powerful army, of the most powerful nation, of the empire of the world, to listen to me. Is that so? Really? Do you know that Egypt had over 2,000 gods? They had 2,000 gods that they prayed to. And did you also know that Pharaoh was considered a god? His position made him deity to these people. And so he's, it's reasonable to understand why he would be like, oh, is that so? And who is this Lord that I should listen to him? <laughs> right? I'm God. See, what Pharaoh says and what you still hear today is this. It's cool if you have your God. Have your God. Just why should your God be my God? Don't make your God be my God. Sound familiar, right? Starting to get a little American in it. <laughs> yeah. See, Pharaoh's not against deity. Not at all. They had 2,000 of them, and he was deity. He's all about deity. Pharaoh's problem is that he doesn't like to be told who deity is or surrender to real deity. That was the real problem. So who is this Lord, and why should I listen to him? I can just see it now. This is not the gospel either. I can just see God up there going, oh, so you want to know who I am, huh? <laughs> right? You want to know who I am? Let me just tell you. Parents, can, you, can, you, can, you can feel this, right? When, you, when your kid just gets a little snippy. Oh, really? No, huh? <laughs> How about I grind you for two weeks then? Right? In three weeks and... You'll be, in, you'll be grounded for the rest of your natural life. You've all heard it, right? So God's like, yeah, you want to know who I am? Let me show you who I am. So like I said, Egypt had over 2,000 separate gods for most everything. And, and so now this one true God, the God of the Bible, was about to trump every one of them by controlling a myriad of different uh, arenas and situations that Egypt thought it took dozens of their gods to control. And so to truly be the single god of heaven and earth, then everything, right, everything must be under your control. To claim that you are the one single sovereign, everything must surrender to you. Would you agree? If I said I'm God, but Tom didn't listen to me, who am I? But remember what Jesus said to the dead kid. Did he have a choice? No. Does Tom have a choice with me? Yes. He doesn't have to listen to anything that I say. Now, if I was Danielle, different story. Right? Way different. <laughs> I'd be a really ugly Danielle. So you want to know who I am? Who are you that I should obey you? Well, let me just tell you who I am. The Nile River, I'll turn it into blood. The, the backbone, the lifeblood of your entire empire that your whole culture is built around. The, the, you had gods and goddesses of the Nile that you worshipped. They gave you life and made your crops watered and land fertile and you needed it. I'll turn it to blood. That's who I am. I'll send a swarms of frogs into your house to, to infest your house. I'll control nature like that. That's who I am. And then I'll send gnats and swarms of flies. And then I'll kill your livestock. And then I'll send festering boils all over your, all over your body. And then I'll have uh, massive hailstorms like you've never seen before that destroy your crops and destroy your homes and destroy the rest of the animals that are out there. So harsh and big that it killed. And whatever little plants are left that you think you might harvest off the ground after the hail gets done with it, I'll send locusts your way to eat the rest of it and leave you with nothing. That's who I am. I'm God. And, and, and then, hey, this, is, this is an awesome one. I love this one. Right? I love this one. So, so after he does all that, like that's not enough, right? Then it says he brought darkness to Egypt for three days. 
Now, this, is, this isn't like, if, if you study the Bible at all, you know that there's a story in Joshua where they're fighting, Israel's fighting against this army, right? And, and, and it doesn't, wasn't like today where they have like infrared glasses and, and, and they put in like little, little co- coordinates in the computer and press the button and it blows people up 500 miles away, like on, on a gnat's rear end, it lands, like you can aim it perfect. It's not like that, right? They had swords and, and spears and shields and they kill each other and last man stand and wins. That's fighting, right? That's what they did. So, 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 so Josh was like, hey, hey, we're doing good. We're doing good. But if, you, if, you, if the sun goes down, we can't fight anymore because I can't see you. I can't fight. So, Lord, let the sun stand still. And he stops the rotation of the earth so the sun could, could, could stay there longer so that they can win the battle. Like, that's awesome, right? That was awesome. But that's not this. I think this one's even better. <laughs> this one's even better. <clears throat> he stops... He sends darkness for three days. Not just for a couple extra hours at night, for three days. Now, if you read the text, it says that he sends darkness for three days. You ready? Do do me a favor, you guys. This, This is the fun part. Do me a favor and close your eyes. Tight. What do you see? Darkness, right? Now, keep them close, keep them close, keep them close. Now, do me a favor... I'm the only one looking, so no one else will make fun of you. Start grabbing that darkness. Go ahead, with your hands. Grab it. Come on now. Don't cheat yourself. Can you, have you grabbed it? Yes. No, come on now. Can you feel dark? No. I can't feel darkness. You can't see darkness either. Because darkness is the absence of light, which means you can't see nothing. But the Bible says it was so dark that they could feel it. That's how dark it was, right? And here's the other thing. So, 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 so they're in Egypt, right? So let's just say we're in Egypt. And, 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 and over here, we're, we're the slaves. We're the Jewish people over here. And you guys are all Egypt over there, right? So we're hanging out. We, we kind of coexist. You've got your house, which is nice. And we got our house, which is junk. But we're, we're living here, you know, with you, right? In your, in your country. And the Bible says that the people... Not only that, that they could feel the darkness, the Egyptians, but the Israeli people, the Hebrews who were right here with them, we didn't even see darkness. We're walking around in perfect light. We could, we could walk around. So just imagine if I'm the Egyptian, right? Did you ever see uh, pig pen on, on Charlie Brown? I'm just getting this one. And remember that big, big cloud of dust all around him walking around wherever he went? That's where it was. That's what was happening with darkness around Egyptians. They're walking around going, I, I can't see anything. I can't see anything. And all the, the Jewish people are like, what's wrong with you, dude? I can see fine. It's totally light out. It said the same thing with the, with the hail. It destroyed the Egyptian plants, but the Hebrew plants didn't get ruined. It killed the the Egyptian livestock, but the Jewish livestock, the kosher ones, they were fine. Like, this is all what's happening. You want to know who I am? That's who I am. And so the, the icing on the cake is this. As if that's not enough, the last of the plagues is the one that really made the point. Is that, okay, Pharaoh, you think you're God? Well, to be God, everything has to submit to you, to be the God, right? Well, Pharaoh thought he was God. So God, sorry if you don't like this, killed Pharaoh's son like that. What are you going to do about it, Pharaoh? That's who I am. That's who I am. I'm God. You want to know who I am? I'm God. I created everything. And all things are subject to me. Nature is mine. Life and death is mine. Light and and sun and planets, they're mine. The Nile's mine. Everything is mine. Your kid is mine. I am God and you are not. That's who I am. That's God. That's who God is. And so with this story here going way, way back as our backdrop, we venture now into Luke chapter 7. I just want to say that Luke 6 and 7, having read this, it starts to make perfect sense to us. That text makes sense. And not just the details of what's being taught, but the purpose that it's being taught. 
Why should your God be my God? See, that's the question. And let me just say this. We live in a very pluralistic society. In Egypt, everyone was of the same belief system and faith, the same nationality, but they prayed to different gods for different things, right? In this country here, it's... Do you ever have your kids say, it's the same but different? I hate that, but that's what this is. Like, there's all different faiths, and we all pray to our own God. Do you see? So it's, it's this, this, in our country, we have a bunch of different people, and it's an amazing thing that we're trying to pull off here in this country to be able to do this, and it's difficult at times, and I understand some of the tension. But in our culture, it's very pluralistic. It's to each his own. You know what I'm saying? It's to each his own. You have your God and I'll have my God. And, 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 and whatever helps you and makes you happy. See, that's what I get from my mom. I love my mom. She's a great lady. And she's like diehard Jewish. She thinks I'm insane praying to Jesus. But at the same time, she loves me. And so she's like, hey, you know, but whatever makes you happy, you're a lot better behaved than you were before. So I'm thankful for that. You know what I'm saying? I know you're going to die and go to hell forever, but you were a naughty boy. You know, that it, it, that's just her belief system. Like, she believes in her God, and she allows me to, to believe in my God, but the problem in, in the country is that don't you dare try to make your God my God, and don't you dare try to impose the standard of your God upon me, okay? I decide what's right. I decide what's true. The great I has spoken. That's the way it is in our country. I get to believe whatever I want. Well, did you know that only 3% of our country, although they're a very loud minority, but 3% of our population is an atheist. They don't believe in anything. They don't believe nothing. They're just kind of going along, you know, 3%. That's a small number, but what's a big number is that 97% of us, whether you're a Christian or not, you kind of believe that there's something going on. You know what I mean? Most, you know, there's the big guy upstairs. You ever hear that one, right? The top dog. You know what I mean? I, I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. But that's what, what people, I was about to say something really stupid. So praise God, it got sucked back in. So, so God is good. Uh, but anyway, so, so Jesus is, is, is kind of dealing with that here in, 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 in his day, in Luke chapter 6 and 7, and, and, and we deal with that same modern-day Pharaoh now that's asking, okay, uh, why, what, really, is that so? Why should I believe that, that your God is the God? Why should I obey your God, right? Who, who are you? that I should obey you. It's, it's no different today. It's the same question that's asked of Jesus in, in Mark chapter 4 when Jesus is in the boat with his disciples and there's this big storm and, and they wake him up because he's sleeping in the boat and they think they're going to die and he stands up at the, at the front of the boat and he looks at the storm and he looks at the waves and he says, stop, and it just goes, Nyum. and they're like, who is this man that the waves and water obey him? Who is this God? Who is this man? It's the same question that's asked of Jesus in Luke chapter 7 later on, and, and we'll get to it. When, when the sinful woman, we all probably know what she was, right? Probably a prostitute. And she walks into this religious guy's house, and she kneels down at the feet of Jesus, and she's crying and weeping and spreading oil all over his feet and, and kissing his feet and stuff. And he says, he says, uh, Woman, your, your sins are forgiven. And the religious people are like, who is this guy that he's forgiving sin? It's always being asked of God. Who are you that I should obey you? And so in chapter 6, we saw this Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is teaching about this and he's teaching about that and he says, hey, I want you to be compassionate and I want you to, to, to bless your enemies and I want you to curse those, I mean, I want you to bless those who curse you and I want you to, you know, like all these orders. Like, and then he starts talking about, uh, why do you call me Lord if you're not gonna obey me? See, he wants you to obey him. So here's this man coming to you and saying, you need to obey me. And so what's the question? Who are you that I should obey you? Right? I mean, so he's barking out all these orders in Luke chapter 6 over and over and over again. Why should I listen and obey? 
And he says, some people, they call me Lord, Lord, and some people uh, listen to me. And when the rain and the waves and the wind come, my house, their house will stand. And some won't listen to me. And when the waves and the wind and all, and all the rain comes, your house will collapse. Again, why should we listen to you? But that story there, when he says that about some will and some won't, that means some are listening and some will not. And so the Pharaoh question pops up again. And Jesus is throwing out all these orders at me through the whole chapter. And I believe that chapter 7, the story of the Roman centurion slave, and this, this story right here about the widow's son, this is God once again answering the age-old question, you want to know who I am? This is who I am. And he answers the question. And so he, he starts by healing this slave from afar. And so just like earlier on when God used Moses as his mouthpiece to declare to the Pharaoh, to that world, this is who I am, God once again uses someone else, the mouth of the Roman centurion, to declare who he is. And we ventured into that last week. Let's just kind of briefly go through there. The Roman centurion sends some buddies with his message to, to Jesus. And at the end of the message from those guys, Jesus stops and he looks at his people and go, yeah, that guy, he's got it. That was the right answer right there. And here's, here's what, the, here's what the, the message was. The centurion says, Lord. That was the first thing. You want to know who I am? I'm Lord. What does that mean? That means authority. I have authority. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Jesus, God the Father said on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Moses and, and, and Elijah and Jesus, three big time players, right, are right there. And God the Father says, that guy right there, Jesus, that's my dearly beloved son. Listen to him. That's authority, man. He's the Lord. The second thing is that he, the centurion said that I'm not even worthy of standing in, in, in front of you. And I'm not even worthy to have you in my house. What's that mean? That's position. That, that's not only, are you Lord, but the centurion's saying, I'm not. We need that. He's like, you know, here, here's a centurion, much like Pharaoh, though. Powerful. Rich, influential, successful. People in our world right now, those people have power, don't they? Nothing's changed, has it? But the centurion says, you are Lord, you have authority, and I do not. That's awesome. Here's the, fourth, the third thing he said. he said. He said, Jesus, just say the word, and my servant is healed. Right? That's omnipresence. That's who Jesus is. That means he doesn't need to be there to be healed, right? It doesn't mean he has to be there in the flesh, right before your eyes. He's here now, omnipresent. And he's immediately healed. What's that mean? Omnipotent, Jesus is. That means he has authority over space and disease, over geography, right? He says the word, and he's all-powerful. Let that guy be healed. Boom, done. He looks at the boy in the casket. Young man, wake up. Up. He has to. He has to obey. He is Lord. We are not. He is omnipresent. He's omnipotent. And he turns to the crowd and goes, yep, that's it right there. That's who I am. You want to know who I am? That's who I am. Jesus radiates the very glory, the very words, and the very character of the Almighty. Jesus said that if you've seen him, then you've seen the Father, and that he and the Father are one. John said in the beginning of his gospel that in the beginning was the Word, and, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word gave life to everything, and then the Word put on flesh and came and hung out with us. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's what the God, God's Word says about Jesus. That's who He is. I want to turn your attention to, to one more text. 
It's in Colossians chapter 1. I want you to go there. It's one of my favorite sections in all of the Bible because it probably more clearly than anywhere else tells us who Jesus Christ is. Remember the opening video? We've been playing it every week. The, out, the, out, the opening video really poses a lot of questions, but there's one question that you have to answer. And if you're within the sound of my voice, you have to answer this question. Who is Jesus? It's the most important question you will ever, ever ask yourself. It's the most important question you will ever answer. Your eternity is hanging in the balance of this question. And no other question even matters in comparison to it. And that's all that Colossians chapter 1 does is echo the same truth that was voiced by the Roman centurion. Remember, he said, authority. He said, I'm not. He said, omnipresent. He said, omnipotent. And Jesus is like, yeah, that's who I am. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. What's that mean? Lord, right? Lord. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Right? That's awesomeness right there. You know, that's position. That, that takes the legs out, out of anybody who's proud because everyone stands on a level playing ground here at the cross because none of us are God. Every one of us is the creation of Almighty Jesus Christ. Amen. All of us. Let's read on. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation Together, Some of you may need to just hear that tonight. Maybe you're just having a, a rough week and you think it's coming apart at the seams, right? But Jesus Christ holds all things together. Christ is also the head of the church. In case you're wondering, I'm not the senior pastor here. Jesus is. Okay? He's my boss. Got to pause there. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. That's amazing. That means that there was no shortage or deficiency that some people teach that when he came to earth and put on the flesh and came, that somehow because he was being uh, submissive to his father, that somehow he wasn't really as powerful or 100% God, if you will, that he was a little bit weaker than the father. No. The fullness of deity, everything that is God, was in that man when he walked this earth. Do you understand me? That's the teaching of the Bible. You want to know who he is? This is who Jesus Christ is. That's the one that we preach to you here. That's the one we tell you you should worship, and he's worthy of that. That's who Jesus Christ is. So you want to know who I am? Well, everything I just shared with you answers that question quite clearly, but there's a little bit more in the text that we were to study tonight. Go back there in Luke chapter 7 and look at verse 11. Soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain, and a large crowd followed him. Why would he go to Nain? Does anyone even know? Have you, outside of reading that story, have you ever even heard of Nain? Do you understand how nothing Nain is? 
at its high, I did some research this week. I don't know what you were doing, but that's what I was doing. I'm a total nerd. At its highest number, Nain, since then till now, the highest population it's ever, ever experienced. It was a boom in population to 1,700. That's how many, that's the most that's ever lived in this little nothing town. Did you ever wonder, now that you know that, have you, do you wonder, like, why would Jesus, why would Jesus go there? He's in Capernaum doing this thing with the, with the Roman centurion's slave. That was a big deal, right? More people see what's going on. They're getting riled up about Jesus. Things are happening. So as things are happening, like, let's talk about that for a second. So if I'm a decent little uh, baseball player, let's say, and I go to, to, to Mount Dora High or something, well, I'll say Tavares because Coach Wall's here. Tavares, sorry. My bad. I'm playing at Tavares, right? And, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm, pretty, I'm pretty good, right? So what's the next move? What would I do next if I was a, the best player on the team? College. Go to a bigger lake, right? Isn't that the way we work? And, and if we're really super successful at the college level, what would be next? You go pro, maybe go to the minors, right? That's a bigger yet. And if I'm, if I'm really good in the minor leagues, then what? I'll go to the bigs, right? So this isn't that the way we kind of work when things are going well? Jesus goes to Nain. Not only does he go to Nain, but he didn't go to Nain by himself because he had a buddy that hung out there and they were going to have some pizza that night. No, he took people with him to that place. Why? Why would he go to this nothing town? If, he start, if, his, if his promise was, I'm going to build my church and it's going gonna, it's gonna to reach the ends of the earth and it's going to be successful and I'm going to reach billions of people. Like that was, he's going to build this church and hell's not going to defeat it, right? If he's going to do that, why would you go to Nain? I don't know about you, but I'm going to Manhattan. I'm going to L.A. I'm going to Chicago, right? I'm not going to, Na yeah, I'm going to start a worldwide revival. Let's start out in Altoona. And then we get done with Altoona, let's go to Oxford. Woo! Really? <clears throat> He's obedient. Yeah. True. Something else about him. It's right there in the text, so I don't have to make anything up. It's awesome. Verse 12. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. Okay. I'm not saying that what I'm about to tell you is the gospel, so I'm going to step away from the Bible for a minute. I'm just going to give you something you could chew on. I believe that Jesus is God because the Bible says that he is, right? Creator supreme over all things. Everything was made by him and for him. Kind of says it all, right? <clears throat> so you think that maybe the timing was just right? Or was it just a coincidence? That he would go to Nain and the moment he walks up to the city gate, dead guy with all these people now to watch. You think there's something maybe to it? I think there is. I think there is. I think that Jesus has the card, the, the, the card stacked against us. He's got to ace up his sleeve all the time. And so he goes to the city and he proves himself strong for everybody to see. But he taught something there about who he is. We want to know who he is, right? That's what the question is. Who, who, who are you that I should obey you? He's a man who in verse 11, 13 says, it says that his heart overflowed with compassion. That's who God is. He's a man whose heart overflowed with compassion. Why would he leave Capernaum to start a worldwide effort and go to Nain unless the compassion in his heart was so overwhelming and overflowing he had no choice but to go that's who Jesus is he's creator he's the sustainer and in his world this ends and in his word Pharaoh's son and in his word the widow's son at his word but he's also very very 
compassionate. His heart overflows with compassion. Based just on this story, what does his heart overflow with compassion for? Widows. It's right there, right? The poor. <clears throat> it, was the, it was her only son. You know what that means? She has no way to earn a living anymore. It's not like this now where you ladies, you just go get a job. I don't need no man, <laughs> right? It's not like that then. She had nothing. He has compassion for the one who is at loss, who is poor, who is sad, brokenhearted. Your only son just died. You think that she's sad? And God just rushes into that person. How about vulnerable? Do you know that if you had debt back then and you didn't have any way to pay it, they'd take your kid? Now she doesn't even have a kid. She's got nothing. She's, she's vulnerable. Here's a woman that's by herself. She can't provide for herself. She doesn't have a husband to protect her. She's, got no, she's completely at the whim of naughty people. And God rushes in to this woman. His heart is overflowing with compassion for the widow, for the poor, for the sad, and the vulnerable. All this that I've shared with you is super, super good. It's good news, right? It is good news. But there's one thing, there's one threshold, there's one obstacle, there's one force, if you will, that you must overcome in order to, 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 to say, I am, you wonder who I am? I am God. Like if you're going to make that statement that I am God and you should worship me, there's one thing you absolutely have to be stronger than to make the claim. And it's death. Because we're all going to get it, right? We're all, we're all going. We're all going to die. Every person, unless the Lord comes back before then, you are going to die. There's the good news for your church tonight. You're going to die. Some of us are closer than others, but we're all going to die. But unless you even have sovereign reign over that, then you can't claim to be God. Do you agree? Nothing can be stronger than you if you're going to claim that you're sovereign over all things. If you don't control life and death, then there is something or someone stronger than you, which means you ain't the Lord, right? And so... As if healing the, the slave from afar wasn't enough. He's, he proves some stuff there. But there's one thing, man. If I don't conquer death, I'm not Lord. And so he goes to this kid and he raises him to life. See, he was dead, but now he's alive. And just like Exodus, when God decides who lives and who dies, so it is with Jesus he decides who lives or dies. See, everyone thought that the kid was dead. They were actually having the funeral. Like, he was dead, 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 right? Dead. Not maybe he's coming back. Maybe he's, you know, just taking a nap. Dead, right? They were having the funeral already. They weren't checking vitals. He was dead. Everyone thought he was dead. Mom thought he was dead. The people in the community thought he was dead. But Jesus... No, he ain't dead. He's not dead until I say he's dead. Jesus is the fat lady singing, right? He's in charge. He decides who lives or dies. And they respond, a mighty prophet has risen among you today, true. The book of Hebrews says that God speaks the very word, Jesus speaks the very words of God. So yes, he's a mighty prophet. But I love their second response. God has visited his people today. That's who he is. That's who Jesus Christ is. You want to know who I am? That's who I am. Let me call the worship team back up to sing with us one more time. But as they do, I want you to, remi I want you to be reminded of this. Even though it's Christmas, settle in, settle in. Even though this is Christmas, and we're thinking about the, the coming of Jesus, in this context here tonight, Jesus decides who lives or dies. And he kicked death's teeth in with this young man who was dead and now he's alive, right? But even greater than that, 
There was a time that death and the grave thought that they had Jesus Christ himself. And so they had him for a short time, but on that third day, Jesus rose from the dead. And he's alive because he's the one who decides who lives and who dies. So if you want to know who Jesus Christ is, you need to know that you should obey him for, this, for these reasons. He is the Lord over all of creation. Jesus Christ made everything. Jesus Christ sustains everything. Jesus Christ is a compassionate, compassionate God. And he decides life and death. So you want to know who I am? Well, God answered that question 3,400 years ago when he visited the Pharaoh. And that wasn't a very good day. And God visited again here with this kid when he raised him to new life. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if you want to know who he is, He's the God that's visiting you right now. That's who he is. And these songs we sang tonight about come to me, he sang over you. And he's here. And he's using them as his mouthpiece so that he, just like Moses was his mouthpiece, just like the centurion was his mouthpiece, but God's using them right here, right now to call to you. He's here. And he's saying, come to me. Let me be your dad. Let me be your creator. Let me be your sustainer. Let me decide if you live or die. And if you embrace me as your Lord and Savior, you don't die. You live. And that's the message for you. That's who Jesus Christ is. That's the one that we worship here at Revolution Church. And my hope and prayer is that He will be the one who you worship forever. He says, come to me. I'm all that you need. Can we pray for a second? Is that cool? Can we pray? Lord, we acknowledge that you're here right now. Because that's who you are. You're the God who visits his people. It's, it, is it such a stretch, Lord, that we would believe that you'd come here? I, I don't think it is. You're the God who visited Nain. I had to look it up on the computer, Lord, to even find out where it is. It's famous for being a city that's X amount of miles from Nazareth, where everyone said, what good can even come from Nazareth? That's how little it was that its major crossroad was a town nobody heard of or cared about. But yet you went there. So it's not too hard to believe that you would come here and spend time with your people. Your invitation is out there. You said, come to me. So I just want to officially send it forward. If you have never decided that Jesus Christ is your God and your Savior and your King and your Lord he says come to me there's nothing magical or mystical about this stage over here we just built it with our hands it's just wood and carpet this is just an old barrel but he did say come so as a sign of obedience if you want to decide that Jesus Christ is now your Lord and Savior and God you can come and just show him that that's what you want If you've already made that decision, that's awesome. Praise God that you're in our family. But maybe you've strayed away. Remember what I told you, the Bible says that by no means will Jesus turn away anyone who comes to him. That means sinners who've never repented, and you can do that now, like I just said. Or you have turned to him once before, but you've run. And you just want to rededicate your life. You just come on up. Don't be shy. You're in a house that's filled with love. And we'll love you. And while you're up here doing that little work with God and telling him that you want to come back into his good graces, I'm ready to come back home, man. While you're doing that, 
while they're singing, they'll just kind of pray for you. I'll pray over you. I'll just pray for you and thank God for you. We'll just love on you. So we're going to just give it a moment. If you want to come, you can come. If not, we're going to sing. And we'll just call it a night. Is that cool? I just want to thank you all for coming and you did make a good choice. You did make a good choice. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you for every single heart and mind that is here. Thank you for the ears that are hearing your word. Lord, now as we uh, get ready to leave this place, Lord, would you rejuvenate our spirit worship once again so that we could stand to our feet, so we could, so we could scream out to you, so we have shouts of joy. We could worship you as you deserve. You filled us with truth about who you are. You want us to worship you in spirit and truth. Thank you for the truth, Lord. Thank you for the truth, Lord. Thank you for the truth, Lord. Now, I ask that you'd fill us with your spirit so we might worship you and worship you well. Let the sound of our voice uh, well exceed the number in the room. Lord, be pleased with our worship and energize our worship energize our worship. Lord, I thank you for every person that's here. Thank you for 2016 where you were so kind to us, where you blessed us like crazy. We're sitting in a miracle. I thank you for this place so we can come and worship with you, where you come and worship, uh, where we could come and worship you and meet with you, where, you, where we could come meet with you and you could come meet with us. This is your place, Lord. And so, Lord, as 2016 kind of comes to a close, uh, we rejoice in what you've done, but we're also super excited about what you're going to do. So, Lord, two, let 2017 be, a, be an awesome year for the kingdom of God in our community. Lord, we pray to the Lord of the harvest, Lord. Lord on, not only do we want uh, workers to, to go out and, and, and reap the harvest, Lord, but we want to see a harvest. We want to see hundreds and hundreds of people come to you on their knees weeping and repenting of sin and acknowledging your free gift of Jesus Christ's forgiveness, Lord. That's what we ask as a family. That's what we want to see. That's what we want to enjoy. That's what we want to be a part of, Lord. So breathe life into your church. Breathe life into your people, Lord. Bring people in, Lord. The harvest is plentiful and we're ready, Lord. We want to see it in the land of the living. We don't want to wait and hear about it in eternity. We want to see it here. So Lord, please bring them. You are good and we love you and we thank you for loving us.